Hello, everybody. Thanks for your patience. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes. Why? Why? While I should say, people come into this uh, to this webinar as part of the RCA Service Design Festival of Better Ideas. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to everyone get in, get yourself seated comfortably. I'm going to go and get a drink of water, and um, I'll be back with you very shortly. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the RCA Service Design Festival of Better Ideas. We've got a pretty good number coming in. I'm just going to leave it one more minute and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Okay, we seem to have settled down around a consistent number of people come in. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Oh, what I'm trying to do is change my slides. There you go. <coughs> Day five um, of, our, of our show, of our Festival of Better Ideas. Uh, we kicked off last week with our VIP show and then our first webinar uh, looking at visible impact of design. Now, one week on, we want to ask the big question, where next? My name's Clive Grinier. I'm the head of service design here at the Royal College of Arts. I'll be introducing you very briefly to the work we do here and, of course, the work of our show that's currently ongoing and we'll be encouraging you to look and talk to the students of service design who are graduating this year. But uh, tonight uh, I'm extremely uh, happy to be greeting our three guests uh, to talk about where next and I'll be introducing them in a moment. For those of you who are new to service design and for those who thought you knew it uh, but uh, but need an update. I am the new, as of September, uh, head of service design, taking over from Nick De Leon, who set up the course uh, some eight or nine years ago. This is actually the seventh cohort 
of graduates. It, it seems incredible that it's only the seventh. But in those few years, service design has become a really pioneering force across the whole industry, across many industries. And each year that cohort of students go out there, they join, they join businesses, they join charities, NGOs, government, uh, organizations of all size and shape. They work in technology, they work in ministries of government and they change, they transform the world around them. And they have been doing that now for six years. And now this year, it's their turn. Across our two years master's course, we have 140 students. And I like to describe them as being the antidote to the technology push that is driving us so hard and poor services that are not designed, that are not orchestrated and create accidental experiences that can damage trust and expectations. There is so much possibility in the world and there are so many issues that come with that. Service design is there to make human sense of it, system sense of it. And here are the students, some of them. This was my first day back in September, first years and second years greeting each other for the first time. And you get a feel for the diversity of the course. It goes across all continents from South America, North America, through Britain, through Europe, through, um, through the Middle East, through India, to the far east of China, Korea, Japan. They're all here bringing a, an incredible diversity of design discipline and non-design disciplines. We have students from product design, digital design, from architecture. We have students from management. Uh, we have students who are social entrepreneurs. We have students from psychiatry and social sciences. It's an incredible mix of fascinating people who come here to learn about design methodology uh, and system design. Now, no longer are we uh, physically together. This is, of course, the world we now live in. This was the day of the final exams when we could celebrate the fact that our students had passed. No physical convocation in the Albert Hall, no throwing your mortarboard in the air, unfortunately, but we can do it virtually. Uh, and this year, of course, for all of us, for everybody, has been tumultuous. But this class of 2020, they have responded magnificently. They've shown incredible resilience and courage. They've mastered the tools of the mirror whiteboard and the mural whiteboard. They've mastered the tools of social media contact, outreach to communities. They've used that media to continue their research, prototyping and validate their ideas, their better ideas. In dealing with this current pandemic, we've never stopped caring about the future and the switches have been thrown. They've, they've gone full over now to digital and the questions of digital and race and environment, they've all been changed. They're, we're challenging them all and the students are challenging them all in the projects that you'll see. We've got to create a new future and there's an added impetus for that right now. This year is so special that these are special students and they're ready to make their impact on the world. So this is the first year we've had a complete online show, of course. If you remember previous years, the RCA show was one of the highlights of my, of my year. Uh, it was always hot. It was always heaving with people in a way that we can hardly imagine now. So putting all that energy and putting all that incredible work has been the job of the RCA 2020 website, which covers all 850 odd students across art, fashion, uh, product design, every single aspect, communication design, digital design, and of course, service design. So on that site, you will see if you go in and you go through the menu and you find the school of design, you'll find service design there. And there you'll find the students presented as individuals. Now, one of the features of service design is it's a very team based, it's a very collaborative, uh, occupied discipline. And therefore, we find a lot of students team up. So you'll see the same project like across silos and Ray, it's the same project done by two people working together, but you'll also find out about the individuals in those projects. So you can go through those projects, but we have also created our own website, which is at um, the URL rcaservicedesign.com. A very simple RCA service design, one word, dot com. And you'll find the same work, uh, but more of it. Uh, and 
we've categorized it into themes to make it easy to understand where the projects are. And those themes have been the basis for the events we've had this week and we'll have next week. Uh, next week, we'll have human conditions that is looking at projects of society and projects of culture. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Ray at the top there is a project, a speculative design project designed to help product designers at IKEA think much more holistically about the products and the things they could design around that topic. So for IKEA, sleep is probably beds, cushions, uh, pillows, I mean, and, and, and sheets and duvets. This speculative project did a deep dive research into extreme sleep users like shift workers, and also understood that sleep was not just about a bedroom, it was about the ritual of dinner and your evening, and used that to generate a whole new uh, array of products, array of possibilities for the designers at IKEA through a wonderful fictitious catalog of new ideas. Another example across silos uh, is being featured at an event at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, working with data scientists and behavioral uh, scientists at Barking and Dagenham Council to look how we can join people together to cross all the services that they provide by understanding the data and nudging the organization to, to uh, serve them in a more complete way. And that will be the highlight of an event tomorrow. The other projects there includes art as, as therapy uh, and uh, an audio service for students who want to travel abroad to speak to students who are already abroad. And that service has about 100,000 followers on TikTok already, a great evidence of how everything's pivoted and we're learning new tools as we go through these, these times. A lot of our students are concerned with climate and the environment. There's five projects that we will be focusing on next week. Uh, climate 101, for example, is a project to put uh, climate uh, content, content on the environment into every university course, starting with Imperial next to the RCA, moving to Westminster and then to Delft and then around the whole country, looking at what is the content, how can the university uh, professors and tutors find content to put not just into engineering and science, but into history, into English, into the humanities and have content about the environmental change we're going through in every course. We have, uh, on Tuesday, we focused on our financial products, looking at new money, and you can find projects on the site uh, around environmental investments, Evergreen, around open banking, purchase power, Money Buddy, looking at mental health resilience, and Mobius, looking at uh, private banking for a new generation, and the Lab Y, looking for financial education for five to 12 year olds. Urban living is a catch-all for projects that look at data, that look at behavior in our communities and look at new possibilities of the two. So London's Land Bank, LOT, is a project about reclaiming unloved plots of land and turning them into food production. Whereas MIDAR, where you control your data, is helping us actually understand our data and who's using it, which is a similar objective to Graham's Guide to Digital Being, that is looking at how can we train ourselves in the future to be better digital beings. Urban Moments at the bottom there is working with Visa to promote walking to work by using mass data, rewarding the people who are walking to work uh, with, uh, with loyalty to local businesses that they can spend in local businesses. And evidence, I think, of the kind of system thinking that we're increasingly finding uh, here on this course. We're also with, a, with an increased emphasis on delivery we don't just want to imagine future services, we want to actually deliver them. Two projects on the future of work, uh, one looking at uh, speculative design again as a tool to help people map new possibilities in a technology consultancy, and another project looking at how arts um, organisations can train corporates to be uh, more diverse, understand diversity and understand empathy in their employees. And finally, we have a category about living well uh, around healthcare. Two projects there look at caring for carers, one for carers of uh, diabetic patients and other for carers of end of life. We have a project looking at the future of food, how to stay healthy, and we have a project in Talk and Brew that looks at how to reflect and de-stress while drinking tea. 
it's a magical project. I really encourage you to look at all of these and Household Health, very timely project, looks at, looks at how you can set up con contracts with people living in flat shares in urban environments in a time of pandemic, where you need to build trust, you need to build behavior that is different from that normally we've seen. But with added benefits of a tighter, a tighter flat share, better trust and confidence in each other. We have there, I think it's about 33 projects that tell each one incredible stories of services of the future and services that are happening now. Many of these services are going live as we speak. So I really encourage you to talk and with the students. And we have on that website, we have uh, links to Calendry where you can talk to them. And we also will put up the end of this, a page where you can uh, uh, get the Zoom room contacts for each of those projects and contact them directly. We're trying to make it as close as we can to a physical show. Right, that's the introduction over. I'd like to introduce our three speakers now. Julian Thompson, um, has recently been working with Systems Advice and is the founder of the organization or one of the founders rooted by design, which is a collective of black service designers. Noel Hatch is a, a, a partner, a collaborator with the Royal College of Art over the last year, and he's the head of strategy at Camden Council. And John Thackera is, I hope, well known to you as a philosopher, a writer, a design activist, um, an environmental activist. We'll hear more about all three of these people as we go through. I invited them here to talk on their specialist subjects around diversity, around the future of place uh, and the future of the environment, and all of us to build an understanding of where next for service design, for sure, but where next for all of us as the switches are thrown, where do we go forward? And how can we as designers, service designers, designers of any sort, start dialing up the new future, what is that gonna look like? So I'm gonna ask Julian to go first. Uh, as I mentioned, he's the founder of Rooted by Design and many other things as well. Uh, I met Julian uh, who, uh, when he spoke, I invited him to speak at our seminar back in January, our work in progress seminar, which we called Invisible Impact which was about the impact that service design is having without anybody realizing it, what's going on. I think that impact is now visible, but now we need to talk about what's next. So Julian, I'm gonna stop sharing now, and I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to the Festival of Better Ideas. And I'd love you to share your screen and uh, take us through your thoughts on where next. Sure. Um, right, let me get the screen share. <clears throat> it's always, always a dodgy moment. <laughs> there we go. Right, let's get to the top. Looking good. Be there to the top. Hold on. Let's it's see. Here we are. <laughs> Cool. Close our eyes. We yeah. close our eyes. There you go. You've seen you've seen the presentation already. <laughs> um, so thanks very much, Guy, for the invitation. Um, really good to, to to join you all online today. Um, a, a really big question about what what's next in regards to design, um, and a question that has probably been preoccupying my mind for like the last four years or so. Um, I've only got 15 minutes, so trying to answer that question in that time has been a challenge, my first probably design problem, design challenge, but um, I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, I'll probably start by saying that I'm looking at the future of design, what's next, from a very specific lens. I'd like to talk about it from the perspective of racial inequalities um, and uh, inclusion and what that looks like for design. Um, and hopefully I will leave, some leave you some provocations and some thoughts um, about maybe where where I think as designers and as a design industry, we can go um, with this stuff. So I've said my hello, um, a little bit about me. So um, I'm a designer um, and very much got to sit at the intention of design and strategy. Um, currently do a lot of that for Rooted by Design, but actually my main day jobs as a service design lead at Citizens Advice. Um, a lot of what I do, I, I bring the lens of racial equity and justice in what I, in what I do and, and how I practice design. Um, and I'm very, very interested in futures and, and community-led design. 
Um, and the reason I think that's quite useful for background is it might give you insight as to why I think the direction of, of design has to go in a particular direction or why there's a particular need. So just a little bit again about Rooted by Design, that's the capacity that I'm, I'm really speaking to you today. Uh, we're a social design lab centering on the UK black experiences um, and needs in the creation of services and solutions. Um, and the aim is to reimagine design as a tool to address the racial inequalities and disproportionate outcomes black communities experience. Um, and that's really at the center of, of what Rooted by Design is, um, but I won't spend too much time talking about what we do and and move into some of the things that I think are important. Um, I, I want to start off by saying that, that, that I think there were some really big problems and challenges that face society. Um, and we know many of them, we've talked about them and we, we're exploring them, whether it be climate change, whether it be global poverty. But, but actually, I think in the UK, one of the biggest design challenges or problems we have is around racial inequality. Um, and this particular commission in 2016 says, when you're, you're black or ethnic minority in the UK, it can feel like you're living in a different world. That was 2016. We've now seen, um, due to the impact of COVID, we've seen Black Lives Matter Life Matters movement, that there is a, a real sort of sense that, that racial inequality and this proportionate outcomes, is it's, it's not something we can accept anymore as a society. And is definitely very much um, really kind of eaten away um, at the black community and black communities in the UK. So as I said before, racial inequality is one of the biggest social challenges in the history of British society. And I think very much that design has a, a really interesting relationship with this because I think design has both contributed to the inequalities that we, we, we see, but it also has some of the, the, I think, the antidotes and solutions to think about how we can reimagine society and, 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 and actually level, level up the way that we look at the, the world and, and those in, in it. Again, I'm not going to spend too much given that, given loads of top line, but we can see that the, the, the realities of being black in the UK means that, that our outcomes are disproportionately um, impacted um, and, and, and our experiences across many key parts of our lives in, in society. And it says something really important here about both how the systems are being designed, but also the support that, that black communities and minorities to ethnic communities need in relation to, to our experience of society. So what's this got to do with design? What's this got to do with service design? Um, and I've stripped this presentation back, but a lot of what I, I, I recognise is design is such a powerful tool for change. Um, and as designers, we stand in a really important position or privilege um, to be the, the architects of the future in many ways. But actually, it's a failure to design services which and solutions which meet the needs of black communities and accounts for the experience that has contributed to these poor outcomes. The reason we're seeing poor outcomes across society is because actually when we think about the engagement, when you look at the services, um, when we talk about public services, the, 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 the satisfaction rate of, of, of those communities are often and historically low. The experience that they're having of those services don't necessarily meet their, their needs, both culturally and in terms of what they, they might have in regards to that particular issue. And the, the, the historical um, failure to design for and with these communities in a way that is effective, in a way that really um, speaks of a lived experience, has definitely contributed to the inequalities that we see. Um, and is very much evident across um, the, the data in, in, in public sector. So isn't this about designing more inclusively? I, you know, I, I get that question of like, right, so we've got an issue with, with, the, with, with racial inequality um, and racism and structural oppression. Should we not be thinking about designing more inclusively? Um, and uh, for the last few years, I've been really reflecting on that in regards to what is inclusive design. And, and, and my answer in regards to is this an antidote? Is this a thing that we should be trying to use to, to, to move the dial on racial inequality? It's kind of a yes and a no. Um, and the reason I think it's a yes is because inclusive design, and, and I mean it not from the point of just accessibility, but in the means of participation and the means of in terms of getting the variety of voices involved in, in the design and the creation of our places and our services, et cetera, um, is really important. But actually, even that as a practice, from my own experience, has some limitations. I think that when we think about inclusive design, we don't often think enough about what has caused the exclusion in the first place. So when we are, I guess, um, beginning to prescribe 
um, inclusive design or and practices as a way to, in, in, to improve inclusion, the, the failure for us to really break down well, why, why are communities systemically excluded? what's happening there, I think limits what inclusion, inclusive design can do as a practice, although I guess, as I said before, valuable. Secondly, I think inclusive design is limited in its ability, um, or as a practice, I think it needs to evolve in, in helping us as designers unpack our power, privilege and bias. Recognising that with design being such a powerful tool for change, when we look at the industry and we look at who's doing the designing, we often see that the designers are not, we're not representative of society. Um, and that really does play a role in, in, in the problems we think of that are important and the things that we give time to and the voices that are heard. And, but also in terms of as designers, the bias and the privilege that we bring in to play when we're thinking about issues that are systemic and, and, and impact lots of people, but actually have a disproportionate impact on a community or group of people that our lived experience from when our understanding is quite far removed from. So uh, my sort of my sort of proposition, I put my proposal really is that inclusive design is great, but I think we need to go further than that because I think inclusive design will aid future generations um, if done well I think in designing and participating and seeing shared um, understanding and vision of, of place space services etc but actually inclusive design doesn't actually make up for the historical lack that experience that, that communities have experienced over long periods of time it doesn't really speak to the inequity that happens and has happened and is being experienced so what I think needs to happen in terms of design and when we're thinking about equality is I think we need to kind of ditch the word equality, to be fair, because I think that's an aspiration. Um, and I think it's a bit of a curveball um, in many ways, because actually what we're talking about here is equity. Um, and this is something that I'm quite passionate about in, in recognising that equity really speaks to the fact that actually no, not everyone is on an equal playing field. And, and that actually some communities and people are further behind in, in regards to many aspects of public, of life, than others. So therefore, there has to be a thing that, that for me, I think design has to ask the question is, well, how do we design differently? How do we, how do we approach the reality that we can't look at people as the same and recognise because people's experiences of society is not the same? Um, and I think that that, is, that, that's a, a, that brings a complexity to that. So... I think there's something about moving from equality um, and to equity and thinking about what an equitable lens looks like when we've put our practice in the centre of that. If we design for equity, how does that inform what we do, how we do, how we design, how we, how we create? And the reason I think that that's an important consideration is because if we're talking about a community or communities of people that have had historical entrenched experiences of oppression and inequality, it means that their experience and their relationship with those that design and the concepts and the, the, the practice of design, um, it, it's going to be quite different um, and, and, and we get different, different results. So focus on, on equity. And that's why I think that beyond inclusion is a question around equity and equity centred design. So that question that Rooted asked, a question that, that, that we've been exploring for like the last probably four and a half years is, what does that mean? What does that look like in practice? What is a practice centred on, on ensuring and, in, and, and looking at racial equity? What does it mean for the what we design? Who does the design in and where we design? All these are really important questions that need to be surfaced if we're going to really challenge some of the, the, the poor outcomes and disproportionately poor outcomes that, that, that um, communities are experiencing, particularly black communities. I'm not going to go into the detail of what I think that framework and that practice looks like, um, but, but in terms of I, I have two sort of views of, of that. So I think that it's about designing more um, for those communities. Um, and I will throw in a, 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 a theory around utilitarianism, um, which is a concept that we want to have the greatest impact to the greatest amount of people. Um, and often, I think, in, in the design of services, especially those that are public and national, that, that very much, that I think, does fuel what we want to do, the greatest kind of bang for our buck. But actually, that greatest amount of good to the greatest amount of people um, actually then really does leave out a, a minority um, who would not sit within that majority experience of the UK. So I think it's something about designing more, but it's something about designing differently. So what does this mean? Um, and to me, I think designing differently, it, it, it really focuses on understanding the experience, especially the experience around black people in the UK, which isn't homogenous, 
but we can see clear trends and clear patterns of experiences that have been quite entrenched for many years. And I think putting new lenses around history and context and identity and trauma and, 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 and power um, and all these important things that we have to weave into our practice if we're truly going to be designing with these with, with these communities in a way that really does allow them all um, to flourish um, and to get the needs and the support um, that, that they need um, to, 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 be, to be who we are in, in society. So my final point, um, I feel like I've rattled through. So uh, very, uh, what does this mean for us as designers? So I guess what I've shared is just my view of practice and where I think it needs to go um, and the work that needs to be done around that. But what I think that means for designers, I think there's something about us unpacking equity um, and unpacking what that really means. I think there's something about us understanding what that means to what we bring into the design process. Um, and then I think there's something here about designers and us being more political than we currently are. Um, and I really love this quote. Um, but essentially, the sentiment is that we have to recognise that we are involved in the politics of society. Um, and that is a responsibility um, in terms of making sure that we use our influence well. But actually, we recognise that there is a there is a political dynamic to what's happening whether we want to recognize it or not, or whether we see it or not, we are engaging in the politics of society. And in many times politics uh, and it does fail um, a certain groups of people consistently. So the final thing is, I think there is a move, I've been talking about it for, yeah, this design activism, um, where we as designers step into a place where we recognize that we have the ability to create change, to create platforms for others, to create the change for themselves, and um, we use our skill to design better futures for others and with others, but actually recognizing that there's a very clear role for activism in, in what we do and how we do that. Um, so, yeah, that's my sort of view of where next with design. And I'll leave you the final point of with great power becomes great responsibility. Um, and if we can continue to center that in what we do as designers, um, then I think that we will definitely see some some new things emerging um, and new impact that we can have. So that's me. Thank you, Julian. Thank you so much. We are in a um, you know we are in a, a post extinction rebellion, a post Black Lives Matter, a post COVID world, and we need to we need to do something to to change. And when I spoke to Tim Brown. A couple of months ago and he talked about how we all have a bias for action in design which is great you want to make some action but i think you make a really interesting point about unpacking and understanding where that action is going to go i think um design activism is undoubtedly our next seminar julian so thank you for that <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward to, to working you listen i hope you're going to hang around because we'd really like to have all three of you and the floor uh of of people taking part in this webinar who can ask questions on chat and I'll ask them to you later on. Um, I really hope we'll have a bit of a round table once we've had all three presentations. So thank you, Julian, go and get a cup of tea, but stick with us, please. No worries, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. All right, uh, I'll quickly share my screen purely to introduce the next person. So we've had Julian and you can now read a little about Noel. Um, no, I don't know much about you before you went to Camden. And you, I'm sure you can tell us, but you've been an incredibly exciting um, collaborator with us, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention to the audience that initially this talk had two female and one male uh, speakers, but I'm really sorry to say, uh, and that doesn't mean that the speakers are uh, uh, in any way second best, but the original speakers couldn't couldn't make it quite a long time ago. So um, I apologise for a totally male panel, but it wasn't intended to be that. So our next talker is also male, um, but it's Noel from Camden, and it's really uh, a great pleasure to have you come and join us and actually share some of your thoughts. And I know you've got some exciting thoughts because you're working with us on some of them. Um, about what you're doing at Camden and about cities and places. And well, you can you can decide what you want to talk about now. <laughs> um, many thanks for that. And I'll uh, just uh, share my uh, screen. And, um, Great, screen. thank you. Um, Hopefully everyone can see that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. It's been, 
Uh, it's been several years actually since I've collaborated with um, the RCA. I, rem I remember being um, kind of uh, when we were um, starting Pop Brixton um, and we invited uh, the Royal College of Art uh, students to come and um, help surface the different um, kind of community hubs within, uh, within Lambeth and kind of like what were the cultures around that and how could we make sure um, that kind of the different uh, physical spaces that we were developing reflected those those local cultures and um, if we look at kind of where those are now and kind of the work that we're currently doing uh, in my role at Camden now um, I've, I've always been impressed by by the work of the RCA and its, um, and its students and researchers um, I, I, I won't talk about that for, for, for my presentation what I'm going to talk about is is design for transition um, and actually thinking about how we move from designing services to actually designing uh, transitions. Um, but first of all, um, just a brief overview in terms of like what we had done pre-pandemic, so how we worked. The quick snapshot of that is our partnership called Public Collaboration Lab, um, where we take a kind of a design process that uh, you'll recognise uh, but we worked, we worked and still work across different levels of design. So, for example, we worked with the skills of industrial designers to um, tackle overcrowded housing. We worked with um, communication designers or, or storytellers um, to help reimagining uh, narratives for our youth services with young people. And we worked with uh, product designers as well to build prototypes for the for the future of our, our libraries so for me looking at all those different types of, of design I think we can really surface um, the skills and, and creativity of different people to help people think and, and test differently how to um, how to improve the way people live um, but um, a few months ago um, as you kind of may recall uh, the pandemic started and it started for me um, kind of on a call, I was in a meeting at the cabinet office, um, actually talking to their policy lab, which is um, kind of a policy design lab working um, within government. And I, I got a call saying that we needed to kind of mobilise uh, in the afternoon for an organisational response to um, kind of start the next day, for how we might reorganise um, an organisation of 800 services and, and 15,000 uh, people with uh, a borough of 300,000 people. Um, and so the diagram that you'll see here is a kind of, um, feels like a very logical uh, model that describes kind of what we did, but I developed that um, at the end of the pandemic, not at the start, uh, but it describes how we scaled up. Um, and what I would say is, you know, kind of very quickly, there is. People that were already um, kind of vulnerable uh, became even more so, but we saw kind of inequalities deepen and people that kind of weren't vulnerable, but becomes, become, say, even more people without social networks, um, people um, who had um, kind of particular needs. And working with our communities, um, working with our partners, we quickly scaled up um, a wide range of services um, and what I would say is often these started um, by our communities. And so um, while we might say it was kind of local government with the people, it was often local government after the people. Many of these services were scaled up quickly at that street level. Um, but kind of we were conscious that um, working at that pace, whether it's for our staff, for our partners and for our communities, many of whom are kind of physically and psychologically exhausted by the experience while they're still trying to protect people's lives. We want to move to um, work, really working with the pace of our community. So really being able to slow down um, and genuinely understand kind of what life feels like now for our communities, understand those challenges, but also to be able to imagine kind of what the future might look like and to kind of reflect on how kind of our neighborhoods and our places um, we might have a very different relationship with them whether that's because we're working from home and 
and spend um, all of our day there or uh, because we need to um, quickly get through our neighbourhoods to be able to um, look after patients or to be able to go to supermarkets to, to help feed people or to feed delivery hubs um, as well. And um, kind of our, like, our approach is um, to still protect people, but also to look at how we might kind of really radically transform kind of our priorities in, in the light of this experience. But what we want to do is we want to learn from the margins and put those front and centre, not just <clears throat> those innovative practices before the pandemic, but also those that we've learnt from the pandemic through our different neighbourhoods, through our partners and, and obviously through our staff and really think about what we stop, what we might continue and actually what needs to be um, kind of reinvented. Um, and we want to take that approach uh, because we know that kind of there's so much um, learning that we need to design in to the way we work and the, we engage, the way we engage people, we need to create the space to do that. Um, and so kind of what we're trying to do is one, to um, create spaces for those conversations, um, but also kind of use more immersive ways to be able to open up people's imaginations and, and to use the different skills that we've got across the borough um, and beyond, including uh, the RCA, to, to kind of help people uh, through that. So whether that's um, crowdsourcing ideas for where people think we should um, Kind of make it easier for people to walk and cycle and put physical improvements there um what the future looks like for our physical spaces be it our libraries our leisure centers our children's centers um and you can you you, you can see here a kind of a physical mock-up of um a, a game that we've um, kind of developed called the future libraries bureau um and also understanding what people would like to do with those physical spaces um, that are becoming uh, vacant uh, as well. And then kind of secondly, actually people being able to experiment um, those ways that people want to live in. And I'll give an example of our high streets, which are, you know, we're already under kind of significant challenge with competed by with like online retail and kind of uh, rent increases. We know now that, you know, high streets Many of our high streets will 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 suffer greatly, and you know the people that work there. Um, but what we want to do is, as well as support those businesses and, and those kind of workforces, is actually look at how we might reinvent those high streets and make them make them closer to people, kind of localize those more. Um, and we've uh, started this in Kentish Town, where um, kind of we're starting a whole range of experiments, some of which we're leading, some of which um, kind of we're supporting to really take a circular um, approach to that, to localise production, to localise um, deliveries, and to show the different actors that can play a role in this. And, and design is a really important part to convene people, but also to support how you actually design in for the short term that can put the building blocks in for, for more sustainable change as well. Um, and I'd say thirdly, um, that recognizing that when we talk about like the massive solidarity that we've seen, that we need to understand people live live different lives and have different needs and also different motivations for for getting involved. And not everyone wants to run a mutual aid group. Not everyone wants to um, kind of like facilitate sessions. So we've been kind of working to understand those different motivations and to great ways and to connect people to um, opportunities for it throughout the borough where people can use their skills in, in ways that kind of that work for them. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a big philosophical challenge here in terms of who is responsible for solidarity. We saw how big a role communities played to help deliver food to people, but we need to remember that like we shouldn't be in a position where communities need to deliver food to people that it should be a basic safety net so we need to think about the different roles that we can help people play but also recognize the, our responsibility um in in terms of you know the the role that we play in terms of providing that welfare 
and, and you know and challenging other decision makers above above us to to maintain that um and then i think there's something around changing the system several steps at a time so um we take kind of two massive challenges two massive emergencies actually which are not new um so the climate emergency um and the disproportionate impact of covid19 um on um kind of on, on particular communities um and kind of i'd say with the with the first um we've really worked with people to come up with design challenges that they can do um themselves what we call at home what people can do collectively in the neighborhood what role we can play what role employers can play and what we lobby um government to play um and with regards to um the disproportionate impact we um kind of we started uh on this in in april may and very quickly we worked with organizations that have much better networks than us um into those communities and really kind of took um a design sprint approach to working across a set of different issues from housing education welfare um etc and um last month we we published kind of an initial set of insights, uh, which we got from user research and, um, and, and research from our different partner organizations and a set of actions um, that we are kind of collectively taking. Um, and I think that that, sh that shows that you can be, try and be systemic and experimental at the, at the same time, that you can continue researching while you're, while you're prototyping. Um, and actually, we shouldn't wait for central government to kind of to make the move. Actually, there's there's a responsibility on us as as, as local placemakers to make to make those cha challenges. And, and those have been, you know, those have been uncomfortable conversations for us as well in terms of like the role that we should have played pre-pandemic in terms of giving more of a voice to um to, to particular communities, but also unearthing community organisers who didn't who didn't want to contact the council previously or didn't have contact with the council to be able to work with them um, and, and work through them in terms of uh, what working with um, a set of communities and then finally i suppose a set of a set of questions when we talk about design which is you know are we trying to solve a problem or are we trying to shift the system and i would say you know we that the two aren't mutually exclusive but we need to think about the wide range of levers, and I'd speak from a, a you know, a, a public service perspective. Other organisations will have different levers, um, but I would say often we default to either delivering a service or designing a service or developing a strategy. But we can use design in so many different ways, and th this is a um, a gift from the policy lab, which shows the different levers that that government have got, and I think we need to. We need to do more in terms of doing um, doing design in those areas, whether that's around regulation, around investment, around um, contracting, etc. Um, and then, kind of the like penultimate slide is going back to that designing or transition. Um, and I've borrowed this model, which is um, an adaptation of the Bacana model, which is actually acknowledging um, that kind of many of our activities and of our services may no longer be appropriate for this new world and so while we can talk about reinvention we also need to talk about how we close down uh, activities um, and how we support the learning from that and how we help and work with people into that new world and i include ourselves as part of that um, and then kind of the final slide is some it's learning from the design council so so none of this is is uh, are my are my own kind of like reflections, but I couldn't think of um, anything better to end to because I think we really need to think about how we design for transitions, and I don't just mean that because um, we can't predict what will happen with COVID nineteen, but I think with the climate emergency, um, we need to design for transitioning to a, a new world, and and that means thinking about design in a very different way to um kind of to, to designing a service in a in a, in a linear way um so that those are those are some kind of initial lessons learned from kind of our experience of working through the pandemic and i guess a two or three kind of 
areas of discussion that we're kind of thinking about, but we don't have the answers for. That's all from me. Thank you, Noel. Thank you so much. I feel I feel unhappy that we don't have sort of tumultuous applause after every speech. I'm I'm very sorry about that. That's a kind of a Zoom thing. Yes, we should be we should be applauding. We do try and do that at our at our college lectures. We put everyone off mute and give a round of applause. Um, that was fantastic. I particularly loved um, going several several steps at a time. I think that sounds a good thing. And I'm I'm fairly sure. I've just got to pick my moment when we drop service from the title of the course. <laughs> is, is it transformation? Is it transition? I think um, perhaps you can help us choose that as we go on this journey together. Uh, but it was wonderful. I think I think um, we see we see Julian, you know, talking so strongly about different types of design and the power of design. But at the same time, what is it we're actually doing? And it's really interesting to see that design council work. Thank you very much. Let me briefly share my screen again, and let's bring up uh, our next speaker. So John, I've known John for ages. We've both been around for ages, <laughs> right back when I was at the Design Council. Um, I'm delighted to say John is a senior fellow at the Royal College of Art, which is, which is great. Um, but John has always been an inspiration back to the doors of perception where we began to see a completely new sense of dialogue with design and digital and, and new possibilities. Um, I still miss that in many ways. Uh, and having spent a long time in the Netherlands, he now he now joins us from, from France, actually. Um, and his, you'll see his most recent book is all about designing tomorrow's world today. So he felt that it was an obvious choice to me to be asking John Thackeray to come and, and speak to us on this topic of Where's next? So, John, welcome, welcome from wherever you are near Montpellier, <laughs> and uh, a little, a little no place. Um, you're very Thank welcome you, to us again. Thank yeah. you. It, it's great to be here, and I, I was happy to. You had an emergency lack of old white guys, so I was happy to help you fill up that gap. And um, <laughs> we've uh, really dropped the ball this time, but <laughs> but <laughs> I'm going to find my screen. And as quickly as possible, you can get away from my, yeah, here we go. So is that working for you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, see it and hear you, you're off. So I'm off. And uh, yeah, what next? I'm basically going to talk about three things uh, under one umbrella. So the umbrella is called um, this notion of social infrastructure. And we've heard from Julian and also from Noel already some pretty inspiring examples of the very diverse range of things that are happening kind of bottom up from the side in as well as top down and but my basic starting proposition is that there's a lot of things that would be more effective and uh, uh, more valuable if they were connected up and coordinated in a certain way and that to do that we need a kind of service designers to create social infrastructure that doesn't really exist yet, but it's to be a gigantic opportunity. So that's my kind of umbrella statement. And the reason I've got two Chinese farmers in their mango farm there, I hope will become apparent a bit later, but my other starting proposition is that we actually have most of the tools available to us. And indeed, they're being used somewhere in the world already by people. Um, so tool making is not the priority anymore. It's more to do with putting together things that are already out there, but maybe they are in isolation from each other. This is under the heading of social infrastructure, green infrastructure. There's a lot of people making position statements and promising vast expenditures on things to create jobs and to get us out of the whatever version of the crisis we're thinking about. Um, but I have to say, I'm a bit of a skeptic, you know, I've been around long enough to know that normally when people talk about new deals or infrastructure projects, they tend to be concrete things that benefit consultants in the construction industry, rather than the rest of us. And so this is unlikely to be different this time, even in the US, where there's a much more kind of febrile situation. So I want to say, well, it's not just enough to complain about infrastructure being, you know, a, giving billions of uh, euros and pounds to the construction industry and consultants, we need to present alternatives. So my alternative is social infrastructure as a form of investment and creativity that uh, enables new livelihoods. Um, 
and that this, and this is what both Julian and Noel talked about, the incredible diversity of ways in which people have been helping each other and supporting each other in the COVID crisis, but frankly, for generations before. So my kind of provocation is that if anybody is going to put billions of pounds on the table for a new deal or infrastructure, no more than 5% of it needs to go for building things and 95% should be for the caring that people do for each other, for their places um, and so on. And I think that's to me where service design can make a transformative difference. I have a history here because you know, 15 years ago now, I worked in the Northeast of England um, on a project to do with, amongst many things, dementia care. And that was the first time I had a kind of frontline understanding of the incredible variety of people involved in looking after people with dementia and their carers, which was a care economy that was pretty invisible to the official system, but it was no less real for that. But the individuals, you know, there's you know, a kind of cross section there, were doing their thing for each other, for the people with dementia, for the carers, in an incredible variety of ways, but for the most part without support. And it's that support and kind of coordination connectivity that I think is what I mean by social infrastructure. And it's basically because, I mean, I think most people here tonight probably know that it's very easy to get a lot of people into a room and say, yeah, let's do something for, I don't know, plants in the city or people with dementia or whatever. It's a much bigger and more complicated deal to uh, organize the projects and the arrangements needed for this to happen. So this is what somebody, I think it might have been Jeff Mulgan called the missing middle, the coordination, the project design, giving people proper instructions uh, and so on. That is very time intensive, expertise intensive. And but for the most part, for most of my <clears throat> professional life in the last 15 years, people haven't been paid for doing that work. It's been part of the informal and invisible economy. So I think we need to move, move past that. And so a social infrastructure is really a variety of ways of providing support for that wide variety of uh, activities that people already do to help each other uh, meet their basic needs. This is Tessie Britton and the Participatory Cities early diagram about what a platform means in terms of the system of ecosystem of people doing stuff. You don't need to kind of, I can't explain it now in 15 minutes, but the point is that the infrastructure is not separate from the ecosystem, but it's the support there that needs to be designed and the better it's designed, the more effective the ways that people can help each other are. But having said that, I do think um, that we need to have quality criteria for this very all encompassing word. And that's what are my three uh, quality criteria, those as you see down there, and I'll go through them. Um, phenomenal, uh, the number the third one, I'll explain a bit more clearly at the end. Uh, and I've got a couple of examples are in each case of uh, projects from the, uh, from the Service Design Degree Show to prove to Clive that I've been through the work, but also, just to, also to demonstrate that it's already happening. So here are the two guys um, from the mango farm in China. And I've shown a lot of people this in the last month because it's basically blown my mind the degree to which a dream that people have had for 20 or 30 years about city people and country people knowing each other again and having direct relationships as one of the answers to environmental problems, to food system problems, to health and so on. They are beginning to happen right now, less extreme way in Europe, but it's, it's happening because basic sort of toolkits are being deployed so that those farmers can talk directly to people in the city. So if it works for a mango farmer in Tituan province, it can probably work for people in Camden. It can probably work for people all in different parts of Europe. In fact, it already is. And so this word relational is just by way of emphasizing that I'm not proposing uh, transactional services in which people pay you to do things, but that the relationships are supported. So. Uh, I know I'm going on about this and I will not apologize for it because on the, the woman on the left has developed a relationship to several hundred people in the city who buy the oranges that her community produces, the same on the right. And because there's a personal connection, her economic and social and cultural confidence and security has shot up 
um, it basically on the basis of having direct contact uh, with people who previously were separated by complicated sets of intermediaries. So if it can be oranges, it can be mobility in Camden, it can be uh, all sorts of ways in which care is kind of shared. Um, so that's what relational design or relational ecology is all about. And as I said, um, you could see it happening in the show. There's some great projects, but the one I particularly looked at in notion of relationality is Lot, Francesco and Esther Jory's way of finding ways to for city people to care for abandoned and or underused but utilized spaces. And what I really like about this project is it's it's not so hard to make a, a presentation in which you show a you know a piece of land and make a screenshot of somebody coming to look after it. Their story, which if you look on the, the site, you'll see is very much about how you organize for people to do the work seriously. Where does the time come from? Who's in charge of things, the regulations, practical stuff, because it's the practical stuff that, well, people like Noel and Julian know better than me, but the, the getting it done bit is often very, very demanding and time consuming. And so what I liked about the, the lot project was that it's not just a quick and easy putting two pictures together, it's a kind of social design with a time element included. The second uh, quality criterion is local. Um, I love the way that Noel's actual biography talked about local places. Camden's a pretty big and quite a complex place, I have to say, but this notion that local is um, actually contains lots of assets, whether people or places or buildings that are either overlooked or neglected or just have fallen into disrepute or isolation. And there is so much potential in connecting things together that are already there. I'm showing the example of Fibershed. It's got nothing to do with an urban situation. Well, actually it does, and anybody wears wool, but this is one of the two or three most inspiring examples that I know of, of people looking at a whole bunch of people and activities and places in a region that were connected but disconnected, namely the, 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 the sheep's fibers in Northern California. This is now all over the world, this model. The point being that in order to connect all those guys and activities and places together, that's a design activity, it's a service design activity. And that over a period of eight or nine years has sort of become a model, but it's not a kind of easily replicable model. But the point is that the local value exists, but it's multiplied when you get together. And I, well, I was impressed by this uh, project in the, in the show, uh, because this is about a kind of late uh, next generation fashion ecosystem project when you, in this precise element is taken seriously, all the different actors and change processes and social and activist participants. Yes, there it's kind of nothing revolutionary about putting it into a project, but this whole uh, storyline in the project, it requires time, it requires intermediation to help people get to talk to each other, it requires somebody to confront economic um, inequities, the kind that Julian talked about and so on. So it's not just a feel good, uh, let's have some sustainable fashion um, story. It's a very kind of hard headed look at what organizational means are needed to take fashion design uh, to the next step of coordination. Um, but I wanted to, again, I think it was Noel who talked about libraries. I'm pretty obsessed that this local word needs to include local institutions that in a very often have already been there for a long time. And that libraries, everything, working men's clubs, pubs, local shops, they are infrastructures, not just buildings, but also people and organizational resources that we really should not um, ignore any longer. And this is another picture from China where the notion of the convenience store is, is absolutely central to this re-engineering of the urban rural economy. Uh, but we can do that. I mean, in UK has so many examples of vibrant local organizations that are being neglected. Anyway, don't neglect them anymore. So this brings me on to part three, because you know, there's no, we could all be here for days talking about what's coming next. But I think that the the qualities of service design are as important as the kind of the functionalities that we're describing. 
and particularly where we are right now, uh, meeting each other on Zoom, and how, and it's very likely that vast amounts of the projects we're doing in the future will have this um, online element to it. It's not all going to magically go away. We're kind of here to stay. And I've been around long enough to know that uh, the horrible uh, bandwidth of online communications has remained a problem for you know 25 years. As Clive mentioned, when we first did Doors of Perception back in the early 90s, we said then, how come telepresence is such a bad experience? Come on, designers, make something better of it. And that was all that was years ago, and still basically it sucks as an experience. So I want to make this a challenge that designers are absolutely brilliant at kind of social design in which you can um, create ways for actors to talk to each other, and you can have spaces that are networked, you can have business models that are tweaked and adapted. All that is great, and that is why I, along with many people, always like going to the service design group, because you have these skills. I think that there's a potential for the rest of the college and the rest of the art and design worlds to get their act together on creating forms of meeting that come close to the qualities that people outside our world have been able to do. So I do quite a lot of work in Italy with farmers and rural communities. And I could just tell you, you can tell by that picture, this is 10 times, 100 times better than any known form of Zoom meeting, farmers and local citizens getting together to discuss the, the rural economy. My challenge is, how can we find ways that are not technical ways, not bandwidth, not, you know, the force of technology, are clever ways to have the qualities of these intimate um, meetings recreated in our social services that we're going to be creating in, in the future. So that sort of experience of staring at little boxes as we're doing now, uh, okay, it'll get us hopefully through the, these phases of the, of the crisis. But this, we cannot have another 20 years of that sort of really dreadful um, non-communicative process. And so this is where the, my phenomenal word comes from one of, I did actually uh, study philosophy quite a lot when I was younger. And the most influential person in that whole entire time was a German called Edmund Husserl, who was the founder of something called phenomenology, which is all about the ways that we experience place and presence and connection to people by means other than the visual. And so he was doing that in the early part of the 20th century. So we've known for at least 100 years that perception and connectivity and being close to each other is not just about bandwidth and having better, bigger pictures, it's something more. So to me, in terms of this kind of future of service design, finding ways to enhance the qualities of connectivity is pretty much at the center of that because with better connectivity, better qualities of interaction. And there's a few projects in the show. So I don't think Amy Frampton's in service design, but she's one of the projects I selected from the, uh, the show generally looks at using art for ways to improve telepresence. So yeah, that's my third uh, challenge under the heading of what next is to reach out to people who probably don't think of themselves as service designers at all, but who could actually be very good in improving the quality of what we do. So I hope I haven't gone over too long, Clive, but... Uh, Not at all. Not at all. Thank you, John. Another virtual round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, and <clears throat> thank you, John, by the way, for spotting two very interesting projects. I think, um, I, th I think it is increasingly the case that we're looking at that missing middle because it just doesn't do justice to anything if you simply imagine how something could be better and I mentioned briefly we're trying to work out how to deliver that and I think you you quoting Jeff Morgan captured that brilliantly there is this sort of level of activity um, now I'm wondering if there's a bit of a theme here and I don't want to make a false theme but I I enjoyed hearing about the designer transitions from novel um, from Julian, you were talking about this transition from equality to equity, and, and you've just talked there about, about connect, connectivity and social cohesion. I'd, I'd love to invite you all just to riff on that theme a little bit more. <laughs> is there a connection there? Is that, is that where we should be taking, as you said, taking service design um, or other people along with us as well? Because we don't see it about, it's not just our gig, 
So that's a wider gig than that. Any takers? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, to jump in there, Clive. Um, no, I think, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you've, you summarized that well. I think there definitely is a transition. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, where does that transition start? I think that tra tra transition starts with mindsets, um, with the way that we, we see things, view things, our ability to remain curious, <clears throat> our ability to not be satisfied with what we've got and, and what we've achieved, but recognise um, there's more to be done. Um, I definitely think moving from this sense of equality to equity is, is going to be a transition because in many ways when people think about transitioning they think about what they've lost before you know and there's a level of comfortability with what was before um, and actually if they're transitioning to something that's new and ambiguous um, there's a really strong role about painting the future and the vision of that transition um, and what does that new world look like and I think um, in a lot of the work that I do um, around design and um, equity and, and, and black communities, it's, it's trying to surface that world um, through the eyes of, of those communities themselves, but in order to kind of help others recognise the world that we're trying to create. Thank you. I, th I think that was a very nice link to the things that I would probably say are the most important factors of service design, actually. Curiosity and not being satisfied and vision and transition. Um, no. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about about what you mean about designing transitions and does does a vision is that a powerful tool for transition or is it more an exploratory thing you talked about systemic and exploring at the same time <laughs> yeah so, so so when it comes to transition when i kind of when i first kind of like started doing service design i identified that um like transitions in people's lives are often uh like like very emotional challenges like for them whether that's positive or or, or, or negative so people mm. leaving school to either go and get a job or to go to university or you know or not or not to do any of those things uh people kind of losing losing a job people you know um kind of being diagnosed with a like particular condition someone having becoming pregnant um and it's also like a, a, also becomes a trigger for for a, like a change in behaviour for people to rethink about like their their lives, but that that that's for me how it started. But kind of increasingly, I saw it in terms of um, kind of like transition in terms of being closer to um, closer to the environment and kind of the, the places we live in, both in terms of its people, but also its kind of places and, and like and, and nature. Um, and, and and that for me, I, I think is 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 fundamental. I think it's interesting that that metaphor, John. That well, for the the um, what you talked about, John, in terms of the five percent uh, focus on construction and ninety five percent on care. And I, I see that in terms of if if we're just focusing on designing new services rather than taking a step back to actually identify what interventions or transitions we need to do to tackle inequality we might just be doing kind of like more of the same but in a in in, in a slightly kind of glossier way um and i i wonder you know going back to like transition in terms of reconnecting to kind of like the the, the very local role around us you know we it's it's difficult you know we can't talk to plants or like rivers or or like animals but we often like use personas in service design to try and exaggerate kind of like insights that we've we've got from people that we've worked with. But what about if we had a river as a as a persona or or a plant or an animal? Now obviously they don't have the same value as humans, but we need to, they are part of our local places um, and they are an asset uh, to to our local places. So that that's that that's something I've been thinking about in terms of transition. So I didn't answer the last the last part of your question, but um, no, that was that was much better. <laughs> there was, um, uh, in the show, and I've I've forgotten her name, but one of the designers from another department has a whole project about the forgotten river. I don't think it's in Kentish Town, but it's somewhere in London, and she uses very interesting photography, a bit of theatre, a bit of enactment, to 
summon up a river that has kind of disappeared physically from the place now. And that's really, it's not an uncommon thing. So many people have memories of rivers that have disappeared with the kind of urbanization. And in Shanghai, for example, there's some amazing work going on to you know, reconnect with rivers that have been all built over. Um, and in France also, there's, a, there's like 200 projects to uncover rivers that have been buried by roads or you know, shopping centers or whatever. And so I don't think we need to be too cautious about it. I think that it's, it, people love it when you say, well, didn't we have a river around here once? What happened to that? There's one in Croydon. Uh, years ago, Terry Farrell was, was a, had a project to do with um, rediscovering the river because the Romans used to grow uh, crocuses by this river and was the, cent the European center of the saffron industry was in Croydon of all places. And everybody in Croydon, I remember that saying, this would be a greatly improved future if we're in the crocus business and the saffron business rather than in the whatever Croydon is now. So I think that it unleashes tremendous enthusiasm. I think it's the River Wando, and it goes just a quarter of a mile from me in Wimbledon. So, oh, yeah? Right. yeah, there you are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's hidden, mostly. Um, we've actually got some quite interesting... I'm just going to mention quickly, with all this talk of, of trees and rivers, there is a really interesting project called Meta, um, which was originally called Trees, on the service design website, which invites people to think of their, their skills and knowledge in terms of trees and foraging, and um, and in, in in doing this, in working with with a, a, a consultancy, a technology consultancy, to help them think differently about what they did and the value they bought, thinking of themselves as forests, they ended up saying things like, "Well, well, let's go down to the dunes and maybe we can see the sea from there." And these metaphors sound crazy, but they were incredibly impactful in helping them re reevaluate actually what they did. So there's a sort of abstract form of rivers and trees as well that. Um, that helps people think about things in a completely different way. It's a really fascinating project. I encourage you to go and have a look at it. And I think they're going to be extremely successful as a sort of professional development tool that they've, they've created. Anyway, I'm wandering off piste. I'm wandering down a different river. Um, we do have a few questions and I think it would only be fair to, to bring those in as well. And we also have lots of compliments about all three talks. So thank you very much for your kind comments. Um, one of the comment and one of the questions is quite similar, but I'm going to start with the first question question from from Richie to you, Julian, about back to your 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 desire to move from or your your proposal, your provocation that we want equity, not equality. How do we create that new understanding? Again, it's a transition. How do you create the shift from equality to equity? What do you think goes on there? And do the professionals who've worked in the fields of equality, diversity? inclusion how do they go about that yeah it's a great question um and definitely one richie that we're, we're we're still exploring um in regards to um what that means in in actual practice i think i think it's also about questioning our ideologies and um our belief systems as to what we've been taught so you know many of us have come from a point where we're taught that equality is what we are attaining that's what we're meant to be moving towards and and we have a whole narrative around that um and i think talking about equity kind of disrupt that narrative slightly and actually then can create questions about you know what what i believe before did that make sense uh, is that right frozen for me it might be me i'm okay i can hear him oh. can you hear me yeah okay cool um so yes yeah, this idea that actually it might disrupt a lot of the thinking that they had done before. So I think it's about, I think it's about taking people on a bit of a journey, to be honest, um, not completely rubbishing the idea that equality isn't something that's good and something that we want, but actually recognising that it takes a lot more to get there. And I think um, deepening that understanding and us reflecting on that is one of the ways that I've seen people make the adjustment um, when they're kind of a bit like, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and it also raises new questions, um, questions such as, you know, what does what does fairness look like? What you know, what what is just? You know, what is what is equal? Um, and I think having these conversations um, and bringing those questions to the surface also can help, um, especially equality and diversity um, specialists, and um, think a little bit more about their practice. But it's an ongoing question, to be honest, an ongoing exploration. But if we have this theme of transition and connectivity and taking people on a journey, that feels like something that the designers actually ought to be able to 
uh, help facilitate you know rather than we've moved beyond the model where designers go ta da there you go um, but it is about perhaps helping that journey happen do you think that's possible yeah absolutely i'm happy for someone but like i think we're, we're moving to a place where we need to be not just multidisciplinary but transdisciplinary um where we are we are pulling and drawing on from different disciplines and um yeah how we do that and and how we kind of mesh and match um, our different practices and our viewpoints is important. Fantastic, thank you. Um, do jump in at any time, uh, John and Noel, by the way, if you have something more to say here, but I'm going to go, there's another question, there's a comment and a question that I think is quite, quite linked. Um, the uh, question is, uh, new age connectivity beyond bandwidth, how do we embrace this ideology without restriction? To the advances of tech and there's a question here about technical ethics as well in today's world where where tech is dominating the economy how design will keep with the design ethics and system design in the age of tech so i think you you made the point john that tech you know is apparently liberating but actually pretty 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 uh, controlling and doesn't really deliver us a great experience what's well, that relationship well I'm, i was referring particularly to to zoom stuff and <laughs> teleconferencing but uh, I don't personally think that it's true that tech dominates the economy. I know it dominates discussion of the economy and it dominates the media and it dominates design schools a lot. But if you look at the amount of caring that takes place in the world, care, people caring for people, people caring for their place, people looking after their children, that's like a gigantic part of the people's everyday lives. And tech has been trying to kind of migrate into that world and create a market from it. But that's why it's so, I, I think it's so important to look at the informal economy and the care economy as part of our discussion and also where there's tremendous ways in which service design can transform things for the better. I wanted to just jump back to what with one question with one sentence about whether it's about imagining futures or doing something very practical. Trees in cities is a good example of where some people are dreaming and photoshopping trees all over skyscrapers but then lots of cities people are planting vast numbers of trees but not having any idea how to look after them, maintain them, which trees to choose, can you make edible forests and so on. So there's a kind of expertise gap between a rather kind of small and beleaguered world of arborists and tree experts on the one side and hundreds of cities, all who want trees at the same time. Somebody has to design a service for tree knowledge and tree experts to talk to sort of city people um, in a kind of practical way on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that could make a huge difference to, I, know, I know a lot of stressed city managers who've got trees dying down their boulevards because they got the wrong ones or some, they chose the wrong ones. So that's an example of where a service is a very practical need in the short term. Interesting. That segues uh, reasonably well into Catherine's question. Hello, Catherine Grace, uh, who I know works with Leeds Council. Um, how do we bridge better with non-design service and city managers? How do we help people realise and make conscious their unconscious design role? The people with so much power. I think that's probably a theme across every project in service design, to be honest. But Noel, perhaps you have some thoughts about that. Yeah, for, kind of for, for me, I, th I think it, it if we kind of go to the root of like the, the values of design that you talked about in terms of like in terms of curiosity, openness, um, kind of inclusion, like other values and, and principles about kind of not not accepting the like the status quo and um, kind of like inequality. I, I think if we start from those values that, that then actually there are, Kind of other people that are either practicing them or kind of have them like deep inside themselves that maybe don't want to practice or can't practice them sorry that aren't designers um so i i in kind of in in camden we've obviously you know we've obviously got kind of like much fewer designers than we have <clears throat> many other many other professions but when a when a like as kind of when a gp um is thinking about Kind of using using the space around the surgery um, to develop a like a food co-op, kind of on the basis of conversations with um, like with people that go into the surgery and on the basis of conversations with with community organisations. That is that is a way of like designing in like a like a better way of healthy living. 
Now, what I think professional designers kind of bring into that is um, a way of structuring that approach um, and allowing that balance of being able to work in that iterative way um, while being able to like achieve deep impact um, rather than like, on the one side being too theoretical or just doing just doing change for the sake of it. Um, so that, that's kind of that's that's an example that kind of that comes to mind. And, and I guess the openness and curiosity is like is the key. Um, and not all designers have that and not all other professionals have that as, as well. Um, so I think there's something also about kind of like removing labels and cr creating the space for um, kind of for everyone to feel that they can take part in, um, in, in tackling an issue. But where designers are good is, is, is they can facilitate that conversation and, and have methods that kind of that, that help um, that kind of help through that. Yeah, thanks. I think that's exactly right. I mean, even in my lousy example of working for a big bank, it was only when we put everybody together in a room and, and actually collaborated and co-created that those barriers were got rid of. And we started solving dreadful stuff like what happens when people die, <laughs> which is not a good idea if you uh, have a bank account at the moment. Um, I was going to ask a big question. I'm going to ask it soon. <laughs> um, but I really like Rob's uh, question that's just come in, um, which, which refers to economics. And I think economics is something, you know, vital to any, any systemic change. There are lots of talks of uh, the economy and its economists who are doing some of the most interesting work on the subject of the environment and a fairer society. But we seem to rely on an outdated system of economics. How do we make that transition to something that is more progressive and holistic uh, understanding of value and economics. I'm hoping you're going to have some thoughts on that. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about that, John? Because I, one of the things I always feel about sustainability is how uh, it actually became an economic advantage, for example. Uh, I so personally think they should abolish the economics profession and put them to work in the fields, but that's possibly not a popular <laughs> opinion. But, um, the, Carry on. <laughs> I come back to what you were saying, Clive, about putting people into a room. I think that, you know, I think that there's so much of what economists measure is, is one small part of our lives. And there's vast amounts of our lives which are not measured by economists and therefore aren't taken seriously. Um, I'll give you another example because I think it's important to come back to, you know, what connects us. School uh, food and school canteens and all over Europe, people are realizing that if they want to get people talking about food or children to be healthier, farmers to be, have a better livelihood, uh, cities to be more healthy, school restaurants or just you know, official restaurants and canteens are an incredible way to change things in a big way rather quickly. And so you cannot at all write a manual called how to change a school canteen. What you could do is to make a kind of telephone exchange or internet exchange where the people doing these projects in lots of places can talk to each other. So that's where designers don't have the expert knowledge about school canteens that uh, and they have no more than anybody else, but they're expert at creating the, the, con the, the connectivity between the, the people, the, the head teachers, the farmers, the activists and the parents and so on. So I think a huge amount of what I'm talking about is making it possible for the people with direct experience to help each other rather than us being the source of the expertise. That's really interesting. Uh, Julian, you were nodding there. <laughs> yeah, just nodding, nodding in agreement um, to that, that we often offer more to like solving problems than people, than we think. Um, and I think that actually in many ways when we're trying to look at these different problems or looking at society or looking at economics and stuff, I think there is so, there's, there's a need to look at the challenges we face from different perspectives. Um, when reading that question about economics, my mind went to this idea of spatial justice um, and land justice and what that means and, and actually how our processes around land um, is, is done in the UK and what that means for creating a fairer society. Um, and some of these kind of archaic um, systems and views of value in economics, like how do we, how do we reimagine them? Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Noel, you were nodding too. Did you have any? Any comments? 
Yeah, I, so I guess I, I was also thinking as um, as like as, as, as service designers, there's, there's an economic economics for any profession. So if we're if we're paid to like to, to do design to design services, we may have a freedom on what methods we use and and how we involve people. Um, but kind of like who who are we working for and and like what what are we actually contributing for so are the organizations that we're working for and it's the money that we're being paid um is is it as as that come from a place which is um kind of you know tackled um inequity or is it built equity um and that that you know i was just thinking Gillian, in terms of like land justice um you know kind of uh, often you know, kind of where we're we're working we're working on issues and and you know being paid by organisations or um, or kind of or networks and 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 kind of that money might might have exploited people um, in you know in in you know visible or invisible ways and that that's not just an issue for designers actually is is it it's, it's an issue for for everyone um, so there's there's something there there's a kind of like a responsibility for service designers in terms of actually actually like who who are we working for and like what what good or harm are they trying to do in the world because we become complicit in that that's a big question that's a big issue john yeah again i think i it's like a like a test can i come up with a practical example this land question is at the same point goes back hundreds of years of injustice and uh, all sorts of historical processes, but there's also a very practical task where people today are organizing uh, to get access to land for people who never had it before. There's a group called the Ecological Land Trust in England, for example, which puts together kind of groups of people to fund small groups of people to become farmers. There's the whole cooperative grains movement, which is like a kind of co-op of the fields where city people can club together and help to support a farmer growing heritage grains rather than the kind of bad stuff that we get in the supermarket. But something that sounds simple, like let's get together and work with a farmer to grow grains, that requires quite a lot of service design and coordination and governance and rules and all sorts of things that somebody has to do. Uh, so I'm not suggesting there's always an easy way to pay for the work, but the actual, the actual value can be created by somebody with design skills, making it easier for groups of people to get access to land, for example. Yes, um, I mean, you mentioned that project lot, by the way, which also dealt with, and it was actually a story from, the trigger for it was Lou Down, actually, the, the former previous head of um, government digital services and still very powerful in design and government, who had found a plot of land, by the way, and wanted to turn it into food production, but her local community disagreed and dug it up. <laughs> um, and, and, and the point about that project lot is that they actually go through the legal processes and they bring the volunteer forces together and this whole social infrastructure starts to work. It's a, it's a, it's a great example, I think, of where we can take it. Um, we've been going pretty well. I'm going to ask a last question and I hope it's not too abstract and too difficult. But the, the premise, you know, my, my, um, my hypothesis, my assumption in creating a seminar called Where Next is that things will change and that what we've just been through whether it's COVID, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's Extinction Rebellion uh, and many other changes that have happened suddenly very fast. You know, does the fact that Joe Wicks is no longer gonna do PE every morning, does it mean we're just gonna go back to, <laughs> to how it was? Do we think it will change as a result of this six months of uh, six months to a year of, of activity on all these fronts? Who wants to go first with that? Do you want some thinking time? <laughs> because I know there are theorists that say nothing will change or there are theorists who say a couple of things will change and some who say it will well, change I'll go first, it's an impossible question Guy, but there are two things, one is that I don't know and nobody, I don't think it's knowable what's going to happen in many many profound ways, it's not knowable whether aviation will come back to its former state, it's not knowable whether we're going to be you know how many of us are going to die of this disease? It's just not knowable. But on the other hand, I don't think there's any possibility that things will just go back to where they were a year ago. I just don't see that there's 
and, and I don't see that happening. But I remain an optimist because I don't think it's going to come out of our heads, the future. It's going to be coming out of what everybody's doing on the ground all over the place. It's the amazing projects that my colleagues have talked about today. That is where the future is being made. And there's so much of that happening. Also with all the students' work that we've seen in the show, there are hundreds and hundreds just within that of ideas for doing basic stuff in new ways. That isn't going to all dissipate. So yeah, I'm I'm optimistic without knowing having any real clue about what's going to happen. Which is true of every day, I guess. <laughs> um, no, thank you for a good try at that. Uh, Noel, do you want to have a go? Uh, yeah. Um, so we we did some we did some future scenarios, but which you know kind of shows shows a variety of different scenarios, but doesn't doesn't necessarily kind of like take you any further. Um, but I, I, I think like part of it does need to does need to start with with all all of us kind of asking that question um, is it is actually kind of it does like it does start with us um, and thinking about the the different levers um, that we can use like in a, in our lives whether that's in our professions or, or or in our kind of in our everyday lives so if that's you know, kind of like for me, kind of um, living on my living on my streets. Then it's kind of thinking about actually, like, kind of who who else can I connect into? Kind of like the mutual aid group. So the person running it doesn't feel like emotionally exhausted. Um, in like my role as a counsellor, it's you know, kind of like what can I do to um, kind of like just help support and scale up some of these. Uh, some of these initiatives what what can we do on kind of the uncomfortable conversations that um kind of we we've had um in the organization um following the kind of the, the black lives matters events to kind of really like embed that in, embed that now and you know kind of what can, what can we do for example with a project like um kind of like lot to to introduce that and to and to make it a centerpiece, and the third, the kind of third and final thing I, I say is that something about the story that we tell, and there's so many different examples um, that can make up that collective story. But who who has got the power to tell that story is so important, um, and so that means that kind of we need to use our role as designers to be good storytellers and and story sharers, um, and yeah, that's kind of. That's, that's, yeah. that's all I'd have to say on that. No, I couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. I think we spend a lot of time here telling stories. We don't have chairs or cars to show off. So we, we only have stories. Um, Julian, any thoughts on change? Yeah, final thought, it, it, it must change. Things have to change. Um, if I look at it through the lens of what we've seen, um, and I think Noel, you spoke about it, the deepening inequalities, um, the surface and the equalities that have existed for long periods of time, things have to change. So I'm very much like it has to change. It will change. Um, I'm very much optimistic um, about how it how it how it will, um, and also optimistic in the role that we all play. Um, and like you kind of said, no, the role that I play, the role that other people will play in ensuring that that change comes about. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. I enjoyed those three answers very much. Thanks for indulging me in, in my, my difficult to answer question. Um, I'm going to uh, call it a, to a, a close now. I'm just going to um, share my screen one more time just to conclude. And, and before I do that, I just must say, obviously, a huge thank you. This has been a wonderfully uh, rather freewheeling conversation from transitions to trees. Um, and back again, um, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. I hope everybody watching this has enjoyed. Uh, I think it's been another incredible event in our Festival of Better Ideas, which is a rather audacious thing to call it. But if we haven't gotten better ideas, what are we doing here? Um, and certainly what will we be doing at the Royal College of Art? So if I can just say, as well as saying thank you, um, just remind you about the reason we're here is the uh, Royal College of Art Service Design course. When I arrived, I asked the students to describe their course, to describe the ethos of what we do. And they came up with some words that we turned into these, into these uh, this icon language, these language of symbols. And I think they capture a lot about what we're about. And you can't be a service designer if you're not curious, courageous, 
and collaborative. And I think all the speakers tonight have, have used those terms to describe what we do. We are definitely dynamic. The students are dynamic. They're definitely innovative and they're definitely transformative. They are not about leaving alone. They do not let be. They want to change. And they're passionate about people, about all people. And we use the word plurality, diversity of mindset, diversity of race and gender and everything that we put into that. But increasingly, we are passionate about our planet and realize that man's place is not always at the center of that ecosystem of the earth, but actually a part player in it. But they definitely have a sense of purpose. And I would I would hugely encourage you to go to our website, the RCA 2021 or the RCA service design.com. Does what it says on the tin. Take a look at those projects. We owe it to them. They've had a, an incredibly difficult time. They performed amazingly well. And the projects are things we're so proud of. Uh, so please do find some time tonight, tomorrow, sometime during your life to go into that site and talk to a student. See if you can get them on the calendar or press on their Zoom link. Um, this festival keeps going. Uh, we have uh, we have society and culture in the human condition. We have climate change with Sophie Thomas. We have a whole series of uh, Instagram interviews at 11 o'clock every day that the students run. And we also have the future of work with Jeremy Myerson. Uh, so another week to go. I'm only halfway through this. I'm exhausted, but inspired like crazy. I hope you've had a really fantastic time. This has been the 2020 show um, and, and it's a, an incredible cohort of students. This is what they looked like two years ago. Go and visit them and give them your love and give them a job. Cheers. I really thank you very, very much for joining us. Have a brilliant evening. And thanks again to our fantastic speakers. And I hope to see you all a lot more in the year to come. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks. Bye. 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 Cheers.